take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. see you here tonight, and I invite you to take your Bibles and open to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter number three, and we've been looking at some of these Psalms, and tonight I want to look in Psalm chapter three tonight, and I want to speak tonight on keeping it together when your world is coming apart. I heard about a transatlantic flight where the pilot came over the intercom and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm delighted to be your pilot for this flight. I can tell you everything is going well. There is one minor inconvenience that has occurred. If you look out the window on the right side, you'll see one of the closest engines just kind of slightly vibrating. So we had to kind of turn that off, but that's okay. We can fly with three engines. You shouldn't worry about that. But you should also look out on the right side and you'll notice that one of the other engines is kind of a bright burning color. That is to say it's on fire. But but that's okay. We're we're still good. We can fly with two engines. But you might well also want to look out and see that one of the engines on that side is missing because it fell off 10 minutes ago. But that's okay. We're amazed at how well we're doing with what little we have. He said, but I really want to call attention to the more serious problem on the flight. He said, you'll notice that there's a crack down the center aisle of the plane. He said, some of you can look down through that crack and you might be able to see the Atlantic Ocean down there. And some of you with really good sight, if you look down close enough, you'll see a a lifeboat that was thrown down from this plane. And if you look real close, you'll see our captain on that boat, and you'll notice that he is watching us very closely. So please know that everything is under control. How would you like to be on that flight? The truth of the matter is, uh, you know, for some people it might look like things in your life are falling apart like you're on board that plane where things are coming to pieces. Maybe that you're here tonight and say, well, you know, my marriage looks like it's falling apart. My career is falling apart. My finances seem like they're crumbling. My children, it just seems like things in their life is falling apart. And, some, and life sometimes has a way of just really tearing us apart. This psalm here, Psalm 3, was written by David at a time when it looked like his whole world was crumbling around him, when things were falling apart. You know the story of David. We kind of talked about this last week. David reigned for decades as one of the most powerful kings. He defeated all the enemies around him, all the Philistines and others. He extended the borders of Israel. He conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites and made it the political capital of Israel. And then he brought the ark home and made it a a place of worship for for the people of God. It became the spiritual center of Israel. David became one of the most powerful, one of the most wealthy and blessed kings in the history of Israel, uh, even the history of the world. But you know the story, David sinned uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and uh, he ordered the death of Uriah. Of course, after his sin with Bathsheba, he ordered the death of her husband, Uriah. And now he repented when he was confronted with Nathan, by Nathan the prophet, but David's sin set in motion a series of consequences that was devastating in his life. And you're, if you were here with us last week, we kind of talked a little bit about that. His oldest son, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. Absalom was upset about that, and he murdered out of revenge his brother Amnon, and then he fled into exile for years. Uh, David refused to see his wayward son. That built resentment with Absalom. Absalom, when he finally did come back to Jerusalem and Israel, began to plot a conspiracy against his father, David. And uh, he began to win the hearts of the people of Israel. And at a strategic time, he declared himself king. And David literally had to flee for his life. He gathered up all those that were still loyal to him, those servants with their families, And they all left Jerusalem to run to a place of safety. The Bible says that David followed behind them, weeping, walking barefoot with his head covered in shame. And to add insult to injury, while David was fleeing Jerusalem, uh, there was a man who was of the house of Saul. 
named Shimei, and the Bible says that he began to throw stones at David, and he began to curse him, and uh, he began to shame David publicly. It just seemed like at this point in David's life, everything that he had worked for, that he had been called to do, it seemed like it was all falling apart. Do you ever feel that way? you ever feel like, man, it just seems like everything that I've worked for, it seems like it has come to naught. Uh, the calling that God placed on my life, it just seems like the Lord is not helping me and blessing me. And David, I'm sure, felt that way. Many of the people that he thought were his friends, he found out they weren't his friends. And so this was a difficult time. This was the most painful time, I believe, in David's experience. And perhaps the most painful thing that he had to endure through all of this was the betrayal of his son Absalom. And so his whole world was coming apart. Now, the question is, what do you do when your world seems like it's coming apart? Again, it may be some folks here tonight. I don't know what your situation is. But God does. But we all face problems in this world, right? Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. We're going to face difficulty. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your family. Or maybe you feel like you're in the process of losing them. Maybe you got a bad report from the doctor. I don't know. But the question is, what do you do when your world is coming apart? Well, what David did was David wrote Psalm 3. He wrote this psalm. Maybe that's why they called him the man after God's own heart. Psalm 3, some scholars call this a morning psalm because it seems as if David wrote this in the morning. Verse 5 kind of hints that he wrote it after he woke up with a, a good night's sleep. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. He said, I lay me down and slept. I awake for the Lord sustain me. Well, this psalm here, if you look at it closely, can teach us some things that will help us to do when it seems like our world is coming apart. And what we really learn from this psalm is that in the most difficult times of your life, you can still have the peace of God. You can still enjoy the presence of God. So what do we learn from David here? I want you to see seven important steps in keeping it, your world, keeping it together when your world seems like it's coming apart. Here's the, here's the first one. Number one, face your problems with God. Face your problems with God. Look at verse 1. Lord, how, how are they increased that trouble me? Many uh, that they, uh, are they that rise up against me. David begins by crying out to God and telling God all of his problems. You know, it's my experience as pastor that I've noticed that sometimes when people have problems, what they have the tendency to do is to run from those problems, not face them head on. They want to kind of hide from some of those things. Uh, some people like to drown their problems in alcohol. Some people like to uh, maybe hide behind a, a, a pill or a prescription. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with taking, getting help sometimes when you go through a serious crisis. I'm not against uh, medicine in that respect. The Bible kind of gives warrant for that. And Proverbs 31, when you go through a terrible, terrible situation, the Bible says that strong wine is an additional help to people that are going through just a devastating time in their life. But I don't believe that God wants his people walking around in a continual catatonic state, oblivious to what's going on around them, because they're unable to face their problems. I don't believe that's God's will for his people. God allows trouble in our life. God brings sorrow in our life. I know that we don't like to admit that. I know that we don't like to face that, but God's either sovereign or he's not, and he is sovereign. So if a sorrow has come into our life, it's because God ordained that it come, and there's a sanctifying work that God wants to accomplish through the trials and the sorrows that he puts on our life. Therefore, he doesn't want us to run from our problems. He doesn't want us to pretend like they're not there or to, to find some escape because to do all those things, I think, robs the sanctifying process of its work. God wants us to face our sorrows. It's like the songwriter wrote, let sorrow do its work. Send grief and pain. Sweet are thy messengers, sweet their refrain. And so David teaches us here that you don't run from your problems, but rather you run with your problems to God. Now, of course, David had to leave Jerusalem, but that's not what we're talking about. And, the, and really, he took his whole problem to the Lord. You don't hide yourself from your problems. You hide yourself in God. 
You take your problems to the Lord. And this is what David is doing here. And notice how he calls upon the divine name, Lord. You remember what I told you about the divine name? It's, we don't not really sure how it's pronounced because Jews never pronounced it because it was so holy that they, would, they, would, uh, they wouldn't say it out loud. They would replace it with Adonai or Hashem. They would only call upon the divine name when they were in a life or death struggle or when they were in an incredible crisis. And so David here calls upon the Lord, all capital letters. He calls upon the divine name. And he tells God all of his troubles. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. He faced his problems with God. He took them straight to the Lord. That's a good pattern for all of us to follow. Take the problems that you have, face them. Don't ignore them. Don't hide from them. Don't, don't overlook them. You look at your problems and you say, okay, God, here are, here's what's happening to me, and I'm bringing this to you. But then there's a second principle I learned here. Number two, don't give in to negative talk. Look at verse number two. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. You see, whenever your world starts to come apart, there's always going to be people who will talk negatively against you and against your situation. They're always going to want to jump on the bandwagon and kind of kick you when you're down. Those are not your true friends. They're kind of like Job's friends. You know, that Job's friends came pretending to really care about him. What did Job say of them? Miserable comforters are ye all. They weren't really helping him much. They were kind of jumping on the bandwagon there. And David says here, he's, he reports what his enemies are saying. He hears the talk. He hears what they're saying. He even brings this to God. He says, Lord, there are many which say of my soul, there is no help of him in God. The verse literally reads, many are saying to my soul. That is, their words are hitting David in his heart or his soul. And what are they saying? There's no deliverance for David. God's not going to help him out of this one. Perhaps they were gossiping about his public sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. Maybe they were talking about that. And they were probably maybe calling him a hypocrite. He's a scoundrel for what he did. He deserves what he's getting. It's a joke that he would be the anointed king of Israel, how he got away with it. They were saying all kinds of things. And they were saying, God's not going to help David out of this one. You might be here. You may have experienced all kind of negative talk around you about maybe what's going on in your life. Spurgeon said of this, he said, Doubtless David felt this infernal suggestion to be staggering to his faith, to hear other people around say, God's not going to help him out. God's not going to help you out. You know what I notice? That the devil can use even Christians to do his work. He can put even his words in the mouths of believers. Peter's an illustration of that, right? When Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, he was talking to Peter. Satan had put words in Peter's mouth. We don't ever want to be guilty of being used by the devil with negative talk. And so David had to endure all that. But here's the thing. He didn't give in to this negative talk. Again, he takes this. Even this he brings to the Lord. He brings to God this painful situation. But here's the third thing. Number one, face your problems with God. He does that. Number two, don't give in to negative talk, and there will be that around you. But then here's the third thing. Focus on who God is when you're going through this. Look at verse 3. This is what David does. I love the way verse 3 starts out. Look at it. But thou, O Lord. And again, notice the divine name. But thou, O Lord. So he takes his focus off of the things going on around him, and now he puts his focus on God. But thou, O Lord are to shield for me my glory and the lifter up of mine head. David remembers what God is to him. Or we could say what God is for him. And what does he mention here about God? Three things. First of all, he says, the Lord is our shield. We know what a shield is. Every warrior in battle needed a shield that protected him from the swords, from the spears, from the arrows of the enemy. The first time we see this word used, it's in Genesis, when God came to Abram one night, and God said, Abram, don't be afraid. Now, why would Abram be afraid? Well, Abram just had a battle with these uh, mighty kings. He defeated them in battle. 
And it was now nighttime, and you know what he was worried about? A counterattack at night. It was nighttime. And God came to Abram and said, Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield. Don't worry about a counterattack. I'm the one protecting you. To put it in today's youthful vernacular, God said to Abram, I've got your back. Don't worry about it. I'm watching over you. That's the first time we see this word used. How great to know that God is our protector, that God watches over us. And then he said this, he said, Lord, you're, you're my shield and you're also my glory. You're my glory. And David, think about it. He had great glory as a king, but he lost all that in this crisis. And maybe he'll never get that glory back that he had as a king, that fame. That popularity, all that seemed to be gone, but David wasn't worried about that. He said, because he said, God, you are my glory. You're the one that I glory in. You're the one that I boast in. You know, as Christians, we really shouldn't boast about anything except Christ and him being our glory, our strength. What did Paul say? God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, Lord, you're my reason to boast. You're my reason to brag. You're my shield. You protect me. Even though my glory has been taken away and I've been shamed, I've been humiliated, that's okay because you're my glory. You're the one that I boast in. I don't have really a right to glory in anything else other than you anyway. And then he said this. He said in verse 3, you are the lifter up of mine head. Now that's a Hebrew expression for restoring someone who is cast down from his dignity. He's cast down from his position. Remember, Joseph told the cupbearer, Pharaoh will lift you up. He'll lift up. He'll be the lifter up of your head. And what he meant by that was he's going to put you back into office. Write down Psalm 27, verse 5 and 6. It says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Verse 6 says, now shall mine head be lifted up above my enemies. God will lift you up. And this is what he's saying here. God, you're the one that is the one who can restore me. You're the one who lifts me up. You lift up my head. I also think about, you know, when you're down, when you're depressed, your head goes down. To lift up the head is a sign of of God's giving you back joy. He's able to do all of that. And so when you're, it looks like your things are coming apart in your life, just face your problems with God like David did. Don't give in to the negative talk around you. Focus on who God is. But here's the fourth thing that you do. Vent your emotions to God. Vent your emotions to God. Because David does this. Look at verse 4. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. So David's crying out to God. You know, when our troubles increase, we have the tendency to run to others and tell them first about our troubles. We have the tendency to cry on other people's shoulder. Uh, we have the tendency to get on the, on the phone and, uh, and vent to others around us or maybe put it on Facebook. What does David do? David shows us that the first person we should vent to is God. We should cry out to him. And notice where it says he cries out with my voice. David is crying out loud. This wasn't a silent prayer. When I think of this, I think of, you know, when I pray, I normally am silent. I'm just praying to myself. In the morning when I'm reading scripture and I pray, I'll pray to myself. And then there are times when I will write out a prayer. I have a journal, and sometimes I'll write out a prayer in a journal. Uh, This is especially helpful when I feel, feel like I'm not thinking that clearly in the morning. I'm not a morning person, so sometimes I need help with that. So it helps me to write it out. Write out in my journal what I'm trying to say to God. And then there's times in prayer when I speak out loud. You ever do that? I mean, when you're talking out loud. And maybe not softly. You're talking out pretty loud to God. You know what those times are? I know for me, maybe for you this is true, when you're really intense or when you're really sincere. Maybe there's really a crisis. And at that moment, you may be very, very emotional. You might be very fervent. 
and you're praying. And you'll speak out loud to God there. This is what David is doing. He says, I cried with my voice. This wasn't a silent prayer. This is David crying out to God out loud, I think with great emotion here. And, and David says that the Lord heard me out of his holy hill. I think there's a sense that there's a point in, the, in your prayer where you might get that sense, of maybe a, an inward calm from the Lord that he's heard you when you cry out. David had that sense here. He said, God heard me from his holy hill. Now remember, David was separated from Jerusalem at that time. And Jews believed that when you prayed, you needed to uh, go to the temple to pray or at least face uh, towards the temple. Of course, there was no temple at that time, but there was the hill called Zion where the Ark of the Covenant was deposited there and the tabernacle at that time, that holy hill called Zion. And when David left the city, uh, there were people that, a priest that took the ark and followed David. And David said, no, take the ark back. If God's pleased with me, he will bring me back to Jerusalem. If he's not, well, then his will be done. But don't bring it here. David was by himself. He didn't have the ark. But when he prayed, he had the sense that God heard him from that holy hill, that God listened to his cry. Psalm 34, 6, This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And so vent to God. Vent your emotions to the Lord, just like David did. Face your problems with God. Don't give in to the negative talk. Focus on who God is. Vent your emotions to God. But here's a fifth thing that I see from David. Learn to rest in the peace of God. Learn to rest in the peace of God. Look at verse number five. I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. Now, when we're going through difficulty, I think all of us can relate to this. We have problems sometimes sleeping at night. Is that true? If you're anything like me, when things are really weighing you down, it's hard to sleep. You're kind of maybe filled with anxiety. You're kind of stressed out. And you're trying to go to sleep, but you can't go to sleep. But here we find David, in this difficult circumstance, he was able to sleep. Uh, he, he didn't take uh, Tylenol PM or anything like that. He didn't take melatonin or anything like that. But he had a good night's sleep, even with all this on him, with all these problems. In fact, I think there's, a note, there's kind of a, a note of surprise here maybe because David says in verse 5, I laid me down and slept and I awaked and the Lord sustained me. I think he woke up rested. He had a good night's sleep and he realized that the Lord saw him through another night. He sustained him. He had a restful night of sleep. You ever have one of those when you, you wake up and you think, man, that was a great night of sleep. I feel rested. And this is how David feels. You know why? Because this is the result of focusing on God and crying out to God. When you focus on the Lord in a time of trouble and you cry out to God, what does the Bible say? Isaiah 26, 3. Jot this in your margin. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. When you focus on the Lord, God will keep you in perfect peace. Because that reveals your trust. In fact, this whole Psalm 3, I think, is an illustration of, of um, Philippians 4, where it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, right? let your requests be made known unto God. And what's the result? What will happen? And then it says in verse 7, The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ. David cried out to God in prayer, and then he went to bed, and you know what? He wasn't sleeping in the palace. That's another thing. When you're not in your own bed, isn't that harder to sleep? Yes. Especially, <laughs> thank you for that testimony, Miss Martha. <laughs> Especially when you're out there in the wilderness. You ever try sleeping in the wilderness on a sleeping bag? When you're a king and used to being on a nice mattress in the palace, and yet David, camping out there, slept well. He awoke safe and sound. Why? Because the Lord is the one who sustained him. It was God who was with him. And that was where the peace came from because David realized it was God who sustained him. 
Do you realize it's God who gives us a good night of sleep? He's the one who, that's a gift from him. And David would later write, the Lord, he doesn't slumber, nor does he sleep. That is, the, God watches over us. He, he's our sentry. And David said, you know, God, you sustain me. He, his enemies could have attacked him at night, but the Lord watched over him. But then here's number six. Refuse to be controlled by fear. Refuse to be controlled by fear. Look in verse number six. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. And I think this kind of goes with the previous point. When you rest all night with God's peace, the next morning you're not going to be controlled by fear. And I think verse 6 is the morning after that night of sleep in verse 6. The whole, this, this is an important time of the day for all of us. You realize that? If you have a bad morning, it can wreck your whole day, right? I often say, I'm not a morning person. I think I've told you that. Uh, I wake up in stages in the morning. I resent the fact of having to wake up. And this is when the devil attacks me. Um, in fact, I think that morning people are not right with God. You say, why, why do you say that? Well, let me give you a verse to back up my... Listen to this. For those of you that don't believe me, Proverbs 27, 14. He that blesses his friend with a loud voice rising in the morning, it shall be counted a curse unto him. You ever see those morning people? They're, oh, what a beautiful morning. What do you want to do to those people? Please go away. Please go away. David... In the morning is a very important time. Again, that's, I think, sometimes we have to get the day started off right because that's when Satan will attack. He attacks me in the morning with negative thoughts. It's like the devil's waiting there when your, your eyes uh, open up. You, you grab your phone next to the bed, and you got all these text messages that are not good. Or all these appointments. Man, all I have to do today. Or these needs from others? Or these things you have to do? Uh, verse 6, David just had a restful night of sleep. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached, as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.